Hello and welcome to Hey Not The Face with your host, John Nash, and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And boy, there's been a lot of financial news over the past two weeks, and we are here to break it down for you. But first, let's check in with our fearless leader, John Nash. How the hell are you? Uh, adequate, I think is proper term. Adequate. Doing fine. Wrapped up our sweeps week. Uh, this is the final final week, and I got uh, trying to catch up on all the the financial droppings and lawsuits, all the stuff that's happened in the MMA world the last couple of weeks that I've not been uh, paying attention to as much as I should have at the time. Well, we do know you have a lot on your plate, but you have managed to make time to squeeze in a lot of this stuff, and we need to talk about it. The first thing I want you to do is discuss the new SEC filings that you recently broke down a bit on Bloody Elbow. Let's talk about that for our listeners. Okay, well, the uh, UFC, if people aren't aware, they're they are merging, making a new company with the WWE. That new company is going to call, be called TKO. I shouldn't say going to be called. It is called TKO because they are now publicly traded. So they have a new company called TKO Group Holdings, and they released an S-1 filing, which is something you have to do when you go public. And an S-1 file details the finances of the entities, and that, that so it breaks down the finances for both the WWE and the finances for the UFC. Since I cover MMA and I don't cover pro wrestling, I on Bloody Elbow, I went through and I broke down. We looked at the finances that were revealed for the first six months of this year. That's what they covered. That's the new information that was given uh, for UFC, as well as I'm going to have another article out probably before this podcast goes, looking at how much the UFC uh, benefits uh, and has benefited Endeavor and will probably benefit them going forward. And just briefly, how much will they benefit if you were to apply a number? Well, I mean, uh, Endeavor? Yes. Well, Endeavor, one is they're they're part of they own fifty point one percent of this new company, uh, fifty one percent, and they they get they issued a three dollar eighty six cent share uh, dividend for every shareholder. So the, the Endeavor is going to get that from this company. They're also now they have a manager fee they've been collecting from the UFC every year on top of the dividend they get. And we can go back; they've been getting distributions from the UFC. Dividends or distributions are almost anonymous over the last several years since they bought the company. On top of that, though, they get a $25 million a year management fee, right? And on top of that $25 million a year management fee, they're now going to collect a $25 million management fee from WWE, which is going to become a $35 million management fee shortly for both of them. And also Endeavor also handles a lot of the sales, a lot of the, uh, the streaming services, a lot of the other stuff for the UFC, and they collect fees for that. And so they are the UFC has been a major cash cow for Endeavor over the last few years. You mentioned the word distributions. Would you mind breaking that down for those out there, our listeners that might not know what that means? Okay. Well, there's a, when you have a, if you own a company and you have stocks and stuff, you issue a dividend, a payment. In other words, you make profit. You issue the shareholders a dividend. A distribution is very much the same, but it's for the UFC up until this point has been an LLC, a pass through company. In other words, they don't pay because they're now a pass through. They don't pay their their income tax and stuff directly. They have to distribute that to the owners, the money, and then they all the people that own it, that own shares, they pay the taxes, except for income tax. It's a separate tax. And so over the years, in 2020, when the UFC was owned by 50.1% of Endeavor, uh, they they got a $300 million distribution that year, plus an additional $12.6 million to cover taxes. Then the pandemic hit that year, remember? And so the next year distributions, the UFC took, Endeavor took complete control of the UFC, 100%, uh, partly by issuing uh, stocks into Endeavor for a lot of the ownership. And they took 100% ownership and they issued in that year a one billion, over $1 billion distribution to Endeavor directly from the UFC. And then the year after that, almost another 300 million. And so when Ari Emanuel says that the UFC is what kept Endeavor afloat during the pandemic, he ain't lying. They, in fact, UFC took on debt, an extra six hundred million in debt, just to take that money and give it to Endeavor to keep Endeavor afloat. Wow. Um, tell me about management fees. You keep mentioning management fees. 
Well, the, the management, management fees, fee is. Oh, sorry, what's that? Uh, just break down what a management fee is. Oh, well, the management fee is the, the Endeavor manages the UFC. And because of that, you would think that them being a shareholder and owning the shares, the majority and outright owning UFC would be enough that as an owner, you would collect the profits. But on top of that, they claim that they're, they're managing the company and they draw another another income from that. Uh, which is interesting is those distributions that I said earlier and the management fee and all the other fees that the Endeavor collects. In some ways, if people aren't, you know, people might be aware of this. There's a UAW strike ongoing. And so there's kind of a comparison you can make here between the United Auto Workers strike and the UFC, the fighters. The auto workers, the union took a deal in 2008, 2009 under the Obama administration to save the to save the auto industry, the big three, remember? Mm -hmm. And that deal was a bailout. But part of that deal was the unions basically agreed to, to freeze their pay and actually take a pay cut to keep the auto work, the, the, the big three surviving. But the big three went on to have gangbuster years and made record profits over the next few years. Uh, I mean, not next few years, but several years later. In fact, 20 some billion, one year, just billions upon billions of dollars of profit. But the workers are now upset because they got nothing in return. In many ways, you could say kind of make the same comparison to UFC fighters is they came back, right? And and they came back during the pandemic, put on shows to make sure ESPN and all these contract revenue came to the UFC and that money kept the endeavor afloat. So they saved the company. They saved both of them, basically. And in return, what happened? Well, their pay really didn't go up at all. And so the fighters now are, they're looking at, they did all this for the company, but in return, they're still stuck at their small percentage of the wage share. My God. Let's, let's talk about Ari Emanuel for a moment, because I, I came across an article that breaks down some things that he basically breaks down his salary. So I was wondering if you would talk to us about that a little bit and give us the breakdown. Well, there's, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is he has a salary right now with Endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with Endeavor, if I remember correctly, he is making several million a year with Endeavor. Uh, he is getting uh, his package, I think, like a four million base salary. Uh, one year, a couple of years ago, he had three hundred million in bonuses. Oh my god! Last, la yeah, just in, just insane bonuses built on the profits of the company. How well was doing. Which, of course, is, again, due to what the UFC fighters did by putting on shows and, and sending money to Endeavor to save them. That's the only reason those bonuses kicked in, right? right. Uh, on top of that, he got an $8.2 million bonus. He gets uh, uh, millions of dollars in non-equity in incentive compensation, uh, other in in compensation. He also, as the head of it, he gets a gets to use the, the Endeavor aircraft, the fly around on business use and for personal use. Uh, he gets, they pay, Endeavor pays for security detail. They give him reserved parking. He gets, they pay for cell phone. Uh, he also gets club membership. Wait, uh, at wait, what club? At wait. what club? I'm not sure. What's that? Club membership? Yeah, I'm not sure. It could be the Hellfire Club. I'm not sure what club exactly <laughs> he's a member of, but he's a member of a club. It could be the club from uh, Eyes Wide Shut. We don't, I don't know. I haven't looked into what club he's a member of. Uh, and then on top of that, he also has a 401k matching contribution, which is actually kind of pathetic for Endeavor because it's just matching because you can put in 20000 as a as an individual and companies are actually allowed to put up twice as much as that. So I'm, that's kind of chintzy of Endeavor if they're only putting up a matching amount. Uh, now, that's what he gets with Endeavor, but now he's the head of TKO, and he gets almost an identical deal. He gets $3 million from uh, as a salary from TKO on top of his $4 million Endeavor, because he's still an executive over Endeavor. He gets the, a bonus every year. Uh, I think they're shooting for, what is it, 4 or $5 million in bonus. He gets equity every year. So it compounds how much he's making within TKO. So Endeavor, I mean, so Ari is not going to go starving anytime soon. Oh, my. That is insane. Let's talk about TKO for a moment proper. I came across an article that, well, actually it was a tweet that mentioned comments that were made from within TKO about Vince McMahon. And um, if you wouldn't mind, because you actually came across that comment first about Mr. McMahon's membership on our board. Yes, well... Vince McMahon, there was a comment that the, Vince McMahon is a, actually a liability to be on the TK board because of the investigation, because of all the baggage dealing with him, right? 
Uh, and so there was some effort, apparently, that they think he should exit TKO, that having him on there in the long run would be bad for the company. But that also, there's been news lately that came out last few days that his stock has been put up to be sold. So there's a, it sounds like there's a good chance that he's actually exiting the business. He's cashing out and leaving the company. And so he orchestrated this deal. Everybody thought this deal was for him to stay in power. But I guess maybe he just wanted to put the hands of the company in the hands of people he liked or something. I'm not sure. You know, I'm not I don't follow pro wrestling enough and then McMahon's enough to know what his thinking was. But it looks like his billions and dollars of shares in TKO are going to be up for public offer, which which means he will exit with a lot of money if he sells it all and no longer be part of the company, no longer have a, a major. He probably would step down as executive, have no major position in the company. I think that's what people want, but uh, I don't know if Vince's pride's going to let him do it. He His ego loves the limelight. We'll just have to see. Now, I want to talk about WWE cuts because there were a lot of them and cuts to talent as well. Now, that was the big difference in the cuts that the UFC made and the cuts that WWE made because, you know, UFC, they gutted the, their office staff. It looks like WWE is gutting office staff and talent. Why? Uh, I guess for, for cost savings measures, because they want to increase the value of the, the WWE, increase the revenue. I mean, one is they have a lot of overlap between, and that's why UFC, a lot of their people were let go when the UFC was acquired by Endeavor because they had people in Endeavor that could do the job that the UFC employees could do, right? They could handle the marketing. On top of that, they can not only do the job for the UFC, they could take a fee for doing it. And so that was an added benefit. And now, so you built up the UFC, and the UFC has a lot of the same infrastructure as the WWE, you know, a camera crews, a producers, all these things. Well, now it's redundant to bring in the higher the, the WWE guys. And so you cut the cost there. And I'm, imagine one of the, the reasoning is because they're cutting so much in um, WWE staff to say the trim costs is like, well, if we're going to trim costs, maybe we can trim off some of the shows, some of the wrestlers, because we don't need to put on as much because we're getting rid of some of those, you know, WWE specific people that do this. And so they can trim some of the fat there as well. Um, UFC that when they were one thing that happened, when Endeavor came in. That's one thing they did not list for cost cutting. As you noted, the fighters were kind of left alone, but they did note that the fighters got a very low share of the revenue anyway. So I guess they didn't, they weren't concerned about that. Wow. All right. Now we're going to discuss some other things going on here as well. And I want to start with PFL rumors because you whispered in my ear a couple of days ago that they have ramped up again. Talk to us about that. Well, I, I saw a lot of people on Twitter talking about, you know, the uh, PFL is no longer going to buy Bellator. The Bellator is just going to go to business. Um, best information I have, and this is from pretty, pretty freaking solid people. I, I can't say their name, but this is from solid, solid info from people involved in both parties. Is it's basically the people saying it's a done deal, I think, are, are right. It's basically a done deal that it's it's going to take 30 to 60 days to go through the due diligence and everything. But the Bellator has been negotiating with PFL exclusively now. And I guess the holdup is, is that Bellator's the, the, not Bellator, but Paramount, the owner of Bellator, has been waiting for finances from PFL, that they had to give them some finances. I'm not sure if that's been, if, if that's been cleared up yet, if PFL handed over the finances and now we're moving ahead to sale or if they're still waiting for those. But that's what they're waiting for because a big part of this deal is, and I've seen, you know, they throw out, there was a, I can't remember what uh, article talked about the valuation of Bellator was at 500 million. Well, they get to that valuation. Wow, by, really? Well, let me explain that valuation. They get to that valuation by some of it's in cash. So we have a percentage of it, of the small, a minority percentage of it in cash. And so that's solid cash. The rest of it is in shares in the entity of, of PFL, right? Now, if so as the PFL shares of PFL's current valuation, you total that up and it's 500 million, but is PFL worth whatever they're saying it's worth, right? PFL, I think, currently claims they're like a billion dollar company, maybe plus. So if they're giving them 50, 30, 40, 50% of PFL, maybe less, 20, whatever, you've got to trust that the valuation of PFL, who's not on the open market, right? We don't know, they're no one trading shares. That valuation set by investors, current equity and stuff, uh, venture capitalists, 
So it's probably gr grossly inflated, but only if you include that valuation would you get to these hundreds and hundreds of million valuation for Bellator. And so uh, I would I would suggest that it's probably not worth that much. I don't think PFL is it's like one championship claiming they're a billion dollar company. That that valuation's pretty inflated, but that's what's holding up the deal apparently. Wow. Let's talk about the outlook if PFL does buy Bellator. Are they be are they going to become pride? Are they going to become real competition? Well, I I'm, I'm I'm I guess maybe you know hopeful for them. I have some hope. I think it was smart from PFL's point of view. They do need to do something. The getting Francis and Ganu is probably very clever in hindsight because they're letting Francis build up his his uh, his his presence is renowned even more without paying him and actually putting him in the cage, right? They're letting him do this boxing route, making him a bigger name. Bellator, if they, they, they get Bellator, they get a, a, a wave of top fighters. They, they, they're trying to build up a pay-per-view division, but I'm hesitant to, to really give much of a chance. Cause I listened to an interview that Don Davis did um, an MMA fighting has a transcript of it on their website. And it was, it was if if they really believe what Don Davis is saying in that, and I don't know if they do, that could just be Don Davis giving a spiel for investors, right? But if that's their real opinion that they're you know that they're this a massive uh, already a massive rival, this huge entity in the space, then I'm very nervous about their future because that does not sound like someone that knows what it takes to succeed in this in this space. But Again, there is a very strong possibility. I haven't spoken to Mr. Davis. There's a very po strong possibility, but that was just that he realizes that's not accurate, but he's saying what he knows investors want to hear, potential investors who do not know much about the world of mixed martial arts. So I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm holding back. Um, I'm holding back my judgment until we see, get more information. All right. So we're going to pivot a little bit because something has been weighing on my mind a little bit. Performance institutes. We keep hearing about these mega institutes that the UFC is building or has already built, one in China, one in Mexico. These aren't your normal little uh, franchise locations here in the United States. These are those gigantic metropolis type institutes. Tell me how the UFC... Uh, how that that business model works around the ins the performance institutes, how they make money, and how does it work for the fighter? Because as you have demonstrated to us many times over the years, even in this very podcast that we're recording right now, how very tight, how very frugal the UFC is, down to the fact of of a matching four hundred one k for Ari Emanuel. Whoa. Well, I mean, I wish I don't know 100 percent how the Performance Institute works. I've actually asked around and the the business, the 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 reasoning behind it is kind of lost to me. I mean, there's there's a lot of theories put forward, but no one's clear cut said this is why they do the Performance Institute. Uh, one is, you know, I mean, it, it's an asset. You're building these properties probably in very valuable locations. So you build up you have an asset now, an actual tangible asset. Uh, you can do deductions on it. So there, that's a possibility. One of the reasons. Another reason is it, it gives them, you know, they have a business they can run out of it besides MMA. They bite in other athletes. They do this. They track uh, various things about athletes. I mean, some people think it's a con, but others think there's a lot of valuable data that you can get from that. Uh, it works in a weird way is that because they have so many fighters, right, uh, th that they can actually by – by making this top-notch facility, it's expensive on, on paper. It's expensive as a one-gym location. But if you if you parcel it off by every fighter that uses it and every fighter in the UFC and the advantage it gives them over anybody else in the space because you can offer this, it's actually very affordable. It's only you know probably a few thousand dollars per per fighter uh, per year, right? Several thousand per year. And which in the grand scheme of things is not, that's like a, you know, one Reebok kit or Venom kit payment and you've got it covered and you've given this benefit to fighters that, that no one else has the resources to match, but also gives you a return on the other side. And there's also the possibility too, that, that, that this gives them data that they can use with their fighters. I mean, there is some fighters that are nervous about going there or if not the fighters, their trainers and management, because they're worried about the kind of information that's collected by the people there. And if it could be used to, 
does does that information get passed on to UFC management? Does it get passed on to other people? Because if you have an injury and the UFC knows that you have an injury and in negotiations, they might know that you're at the end of your career and they there's no reason to sign you because they know your longevity is you know in question uh, or that you have other health problems that they don't want to have any part to do with. So it, it, there's a lot of possibilities, and it could be very well that all of these come together and it makes it a uh, it makes it a worthwhile investment for them. How about for the fighters, though? It, we've we've seen comments and um, people talking about how the UFC charges for medicals, they charge for f- flights, for hotels, for every little thing they they charge the fighter for. Is this another instance of them being able to hold the fighter accountable for X amount of dollars because, hey, you're training at our institute? No, I, I think it's actually kind of the opposite. But one thing the UFC okay. does offer more in the sense of uh, of, uh, of 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 care and uh, and guidance towards your career, um, basically handholding, because they have people that that work with you on your you know in your promotional appearances. They have people that come around and and guide you of where to show up for events and you know and book your flights and and they and they do pay more probably and the and the expenses for a lot of that that stuff that travel expenses and hotel. And other MMA promotions because other MMA promotions just can't compete with the the amount of resources the UFC has. So this is one other thing that they can offer that no other promotion can can compete with because no other promotion can build something like this. And like I said, if you have hundreds of fighters per year passing through this, well, it, it then the cost plummets per fighter to very a very small amount. But per fighter, the benefit it gets that individual fighter is something that no other promotion can match, especially in like other countries like Mexico and, and uh, China, where resources, the fighters' resources are probably uh, cash trapped. You know, the fighters there don't have a lot of money themselves or their, their trainers don't, but then they can put this, this, this resource there and build up fighters in a market they really want to expand to. Oh. So it does that as well. So it's it for a fighter, it's, it is probably a big benefit compared, especially like if you're a fighter making 20,000 a year and this, just going to this facility and they have free food, free training is a several thousand dollar benefit. Well, that's big for you as a fighter, right? Mm. And that also is because no one else can do it at this scale, even though it costs, you know, the UFC of just a few thousand dollars per fighter and the fighter gets maybe twice as much from it. No other promotion can do that. And so that's an added benefit to those to those fighters and a benefit to the UFC because they they've introduced something that is very hard for potential competition and quotations to ever compete with. Okay. All right. So I actually am way happy with that response because it actually seems like the UFC get through the dog a bone, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, what's their motivation for doing it? I don't know. They're a business and businesses, corporations do not generally do stuff just out of the, the sometimes they do stuff to be kind, but usually there's an ulterior motive, motive for doing it, for being nice, you know, for anything, for charity, whatever, for major businesses, because they get a positive PR out of it. But in this case, this is something that probably is good for fighters. Okay. Well, our last topic, I have two things that are going to tie into each other. Ticket prices for UFC 295 are ridiculous. The lowest price is $777, and that is for your nosebleeds, $777. The highest ticket price right now, and these are straight ticket prices, not going through a second seller, not going through scalpers. This is straight up ticket master pricing. Um the highest price ticket goes for almost $16,000. Break it down for us. Why this particular event when we have UFC 300 right around the corner? What you think UFC 300 prices will look like? And is this ushering in sort of a movement of um, inflation era pricing? Well, one is we got to point out is that UFC ticket prices have been going up a lot lately. They, they, their gates, because they've limited supply, 
the, the gates have gone through the roof, right? We've had several, you know, record-breaking gates previous years, the, the $7 million gate, $5 million, $10 million gate, which used to be unheard of in the, uh, several years ago is now very common, basically boxing number gates, which was very uncommon in the UFC. So that's one. Two, I think it says a lot about John Jones' appeal and John Jones versus Stipe is that, uh, that the appeal is there. This is a mega fight for the, the hardcore fan that's willing to pay out. This is something they want to see because these are two well-known fighters right but it also suggests to me that it suggests that damn france and gano versus john jones would have done monstrous business and in some ways if you listen france gano did an interview recently with um, joe rogan and he laid out what happened and everything and i was listening to that interview and i gotta say john jones probably probably should be kicking himself because france had gone laid out the plan to wait out a sunset provision john jones could have done the same uh, the two of them, that doesn't mean he has to go fight somewhere else, but the two of them then could take this fight that's going to be my, and I've talked to people in the industry, boxing, MMA guys, everybody knows this fight is monstrous, either in the UFC or outside the UFC. They could have then taken that fight to the UFC or somewhere else and said, we want to keep all the money for ourselves, right? Well, the tickets for Miocic versus John Jones suggest there's a huge demand for that. Uh, I think John Jones or Zingano would do much more, plus the pay-per-view sales and everything. There, I can't help but think that this was a fight that the two would have split easily with a split, fifty million, a hundred million dollars, so fifty million each minimum. And so uh, now John Jones fighting Miocic, he's going to make some money, but I don't think he's going to make anything close to that. Wow. All right, my tie-in for that is we have two new champions right now. We have Sean Strickland and we have Sean O'Malley, the the, the double Sean's. <laughs> uh, we have the possibility of Colby Covington over, overcoming Leon Edwards. You never know what could happen there. But the point I'm making here is what do you think the earning potential of these three men are? Well, I, I got to think Sean O'Malley has the highest. There just seems to be he seems to appeal to a fan base that uh, of young people on the internet could be that just that I'm not, a, I'm just not part of, I'm not really aware of, but he seems to have a very, he does seem to have an actual very strong individual fan base. Like he has, and I have to get the guy has some charisma. There's some, you know, he has a, a personality of sorts that you can see why there's interest in him. And so he, especially for 135 pounder, he has some fan base, obviously can sell more pay-per-views than other fighters that weight. Uh, probably more than any fighter ever in the UFC at that weight. Remember McGregor started at 145, so no match for that. But he seems to have the strongest fan base. Now, the other two, I do think they have some appeal. I just don't think they have w widespread appeal. I think they could they could do okay. There, there's a fan, a group of uh, both differently. You know, there's a group that because he appeals to the mega guys, you know, the, the you know, the uh, Colby, uh, I mean, literally the, you know, he does the whole Trump thing. Where's the hat, the mega make America great, literally targets that audience. He could probably sell more than the generic fighter. Uh, Covington too. I mean, I come with Strickland too, because he just has a weird, just, I mean, just a weird, weird there's no other way to describe it. Weird vibe. I think, all maps they add something to the American domestic pay per view buy, but I think that's limited. I think it, it they did take a hit when Adesanya lost because, as much as maybe Strickland can sell as much in the U.S., maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, you do lose a a large amount of sales in in Oceania, in New Zealand, and in, in Australia, and even though those tickets are a little bit cheaper, that that is several hundred thousand pay per view buys probably from those those places when he fights. And they're, you know, they're two thirds the price of a American price. That still adds up. So I don't think they're going to recoup that money with uh, Sean Strickland. That's why I think they're immediately doing the rematch. They want to give uh, Israel an, an, a chance to win it back because they want to. Uh, they they have Volkanovski, but they 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 like that. They like keeping that market happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, what well, one last thing here, real quick, because I, I want to go back to John Jones and these ticket sales. John Jones hasn't traditionally been this big a draw. Not I mean, at all. Uh, so we have to wonder, is part of this because we haven't seen Conor McGregor in a pay-per-view in so long? 
It it might be. I mean, there's a there's a built up demand. They they want big bites, but but we could say the same thing. You know, like Bud Crawford was not a big pay, you know ticket seller either, right? And Errol Spence. But then you put him on that fight, and they did twenty million plus gate. And I think there is something about uh, you know I was as someone once told me, a, a, you know, a broadcaster. Uh, sometimes one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals four or eight. You know, you get the right two people together, and it the sky's the limits. And I think John Jones, the way he's come back, the, the, his absence has actually built him up as a more mythical figure, winning the heavyweight championship the way he did. And, uh, you know, and he, now he has a challenger that everybody knows the name of. It, it, it builds it up and it's in New York City and there's just a bunch of other reasons with it. But it's I think a big part of it is John Jones is now a he's a bigger star now than he was when he left, which was, he was a big star then, you know, but, uh, and I think, and again, it's, it, it's strange enough to say is that, you know, we look at people down play, uh, Brandon Sagano's pay-per-view sales are huge, but his Q rating has just been going through the roof ever since he left the UFC. Right. Mm. The talk he's been on show he has been on everything. He's going to be, he's going to be just super well-known based on long as he doesn't get absolutely embarrassed by Tyson Fury. Um, he's going to be super well-known after that. And so, uh that that's a fight that uh god that, that's you're you're talking about probably the biggest I, I when people say that's the biggest mma fight possible in history i'm starting to believe them that that's bigger than khabib versus mcgregor uh that that has the potential to be the biggest fight ever in mma history and right now it doesn't look like we're going to get it so back to my original question do you think these inflated prices are going to be a thing going forward, like these extreme pricing? I hope not. I mean, it's just, I, I don't think so because it, just like in boxing, it's only an occasional you get these events that just sell. I guess maybe going forward, there'll be an event, one or one event a year or every other year that's so big that we can get these kind of prices. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I just don't, MMA has not been built on those type of tickets. But again, Endeavor, they're smart about this. They track this information and they've been intentionally, you know, putting shows in the apex, limiting the supply. And so maybe they know, maybe they have information that know that they can push ticket sales much, much higher than we've had in the past. So I guess my answer is, I don't know. All right. Well, that's going to wrap us up. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. A lot of information packed into a small capsule of time for you. Yeah, we don't. If you didn't enjoy it, we don't care. We really, <laughs> you're not. You're not go. Well, let's do another. If you didn't enjoy this, go somewhere else. We don't need you. <laughs> don't listen to John. Um, anyways, if you would. Do us the kindness of subscribing because that helps us. That keeps us afloat. That allows for these shows like this to continue moving forward. And for those of you that are subscribers, we thank you from the bottoms of our heart. Please continue to read. Please continue to listen. We work for bloodyelbow.com. Make sure you go over there. Check everything out. Uh, John, what do you have coming up for us? I know you have a piece in the works that will be out this week. Yeah, it should be out Monday, might be Tuesday, probably right around when this comes out, uh, is a piece about a lot of what we talked about today, maybe more detail about what Endeavor has, um, what they've been, how they've benefited from the UFC over the years. Uh, and then I've got some other stuff in the works, uh, articles, I don't want to jinx them yet, but uh, I guess we'll have some about Nganu and his fight with Fury, I have a... This boxing article I've had for a long time, I've been piecing together. So it's, uh, I mean, just I've been reading all the congressional hearings about boxing going back to 1960, and it's just it's just hundreds and hundreds of pages. So it's it's a pain to get through. So uh, I got that, and then you know we'll have uh, another Hey Not the Face podcast coming up. That's right. That's right. So there you have it, folks. You know the drill. Until next time, please stay safe. Not in the face! Thank you.